You may be seated. Bless the Lord. We had a wonderful Rosh Chodesh last night. Yes, we did. It was wonderful. We had about 70 people here. And uh, when we did our circle, uh, we, had, we were almost out of room. We almost couldn't make the whole circle last night. It was wonderful. And, of course, we saw a very interesting event take place. And we had the Shabbat candles up here. And Pastor Nita had uh, lit them for the for Arab Shabbat and the, the candle that would be on the left on your right went out while the speakers were, were speaking getting ready for Rosh Chodesh and so I looked down and I said ah oh, the candle's out and then Catherine said several people were telling her the candle's out so I guess she figured she's going to probably relight it when she gets up there or whatever after looking at that candle says why did they go out it was burning so nice and while I'm looking at it Poof, we're back into a flame just like that. Whoa, that was cool. It wasn't a little grow, you know, growing a little flicker ember and got bigger and bigger. It just boom, back into a flame. Wow, Lord, what are you trying to do there? <laughs> and El and uh, Pastor Catherine went up there and she goes, I said, I don't feel like I can hardly stand. I feel goosebumps, you know, all this kind of stuff, you know. And, and she's looking at that and that and and that candle was burning brighter than the rest. It was amazing. So I don't know what happened there last night, but it was pretty cool. You know, you know, sometimes God does this. We're easily uh, entertained and pleased, you know. <laughs> we see this candle. Yeah, we see this candle and say, thank you, Lord, you know. He does little things sometimes, just kind of let, it, let you know that he's around and about all the time. Bless the Lord. So uh, we also have a, a testimony this morning. I think Laura wants to give a quick testimony. So we'll uh, let Laura tell us here. Yes, I'm, I tithe and I give offerings, and I believe God for money. And how I believe, it's, it's, it's all different times. I always believe for it to come in my checkbook that I'll have more than, than uh, the bank will tell me I have more than I have. And so, but I wait three months before I take it. And so anyway, three months ago, I got $200 extra in the checking account. So I said, oh, praise God. And then the next month, I got $300 in the checking account extra. And I said, oh, that's great. So I got, this month, I got $400 in the checking account. And so I took $170 of it, and I'll see what's happened next month. But I can believe for my money to come in my checking account to help me to get it. So God said he would supply all our needs according to his riches and glory. Amen. Thank you, Laura. How true that is. Amen. When we trust in the Lord, he will meet all our needs. Amen. Amen. All right, this is the period of time where we do our first fruits prayer. This is when we seek our God uh, for a couple of minutes here on a one-on-one -on -one basis. We want everybody in here today to be straight with God, that everything be clear with them, with God. Because when we're all in unison in, in belief and, and in repentance and seeking the, 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 the great things of our Lord, God moves in the house. And we want God to move in the house. It's the same concept as the priest washing at the brazen labor before they enter the tabernacle. They prepare themselves, they know they're washed, they are clean, and then they go in to minister to the Lord to trim the lights and the burn incense. And even before they go and offer any sacrifices at the altar, the brazen altar, they have to wash at the brazen laver. And that brazen laver is made out of polished brass mirrors of the Hebrew women. So when they look into that brazen laver, they see themselves in it. They see their faces. And the way the scripture goes on that, anytime you look at yourself in a mirror, you behold who you really are. And so the priest will look in there and they'll see themselves and realize that I am in need of repentance. And so they, they wash in the water. But once they wash in the water, they're now clean to be able to minister before the Lord in the tabernacle. And so that's why we always like to start our service off 
with the, what we call the first fruits prayer. It's our way of washing in the brazen labor. So you need to be thinking that if you look into a mirror of God, what, does, what do you see? What do you think God sees? And if, that, and if you need to repent, then repent. Because that's the wonderful thing about Yeshua. If we repent and really mean it, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And so we need to do that on a constant basis. So we like to start our service off that way. So for the next two minutes, let's do a little one-on-one -on -one with God because he wants to hear from you. Father God, we just welcome you into this house this day. Tabernacle among your people. Receive us, Lord. Look down from your heavenly throne, Lord God, and receive us this day. And join with us in fellowship and worship as we honor and praise your name this day. Forgive us of our iniquities by the blood of the Lamb, by Yeshua HaMashiach, his atonement for us, Lord, that we may be made pure and holy before your eyes because of his mighty work that he had done upon that cross. We thank you, Lord, and we bless you, Lord, and you certainly are welcome in this house this day, Lord, to inhabit our praises and take in our praises and worship as the incense smoke rises from the golden altar before your throne, Lord. Let it be a pleasant smell. Let it be a pleasant sight to your eyes. In Yeshua's mighty name, amen. Are we ready to worship? Yes. All right, let's worship our God.
God and he shall reign forevermore for the Lord he is God for the Lord he is God and he shall reign forevermore you are the our God. He is worthy of our shouts and our praise. Amen. All righty. Worship team, you got your dancing feet ready to go? <laughs> I give a moment here. our God. Hallelujah. You know the Lord tells us to shout for joy. Yes. Shout unto the Lord with the voice of triumph. Yes. King David in Psalms says shouting is one of the forms of worship. Amen. But I know we're, we're too cultured for that, right? <laughs> Hallelujah! <laughs> Bless our God. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous of the Lord. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous of the Lord. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things for us. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things for us. The Lord's right hand reigns on high. The Lord's right hand reigns on high. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous of the Lord. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous of the Lord. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things for us. The Lord's right hand.
voice of the righteous of the Lord. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous of the Lord. Of the righteous of the Lord. Of the righteous of the Lord. Shouts of joy. Please welcome each other in a Shabbat Shalom.
Shabbat Shalom. Welcome all of you here this morning. Thank you for choosing to worship with us. Do we have any new visitors with us this morning? Raise your hands. Welcome. Praise God. Thank you for being here. Welcome to all our online viewers. Thank you for being with us. Uh, for such a time, radio broadcast, Rab Rabbi Allen's radio program called For Such a Time is broadcast every Sunday afternoon at 1 p.m. on KPXQ, 1360 a.m. So make sure you listen on Sunday afternoons. Passover Seder meeting, our second Passover Seder meeting will be held today at 1 p.m. We need volunteers to help. Please come and see where you can fit in. We do need help, so please attend the meeting at 1 p.m. today. Uh, because of unforeseen circumstances, Tuesday evening, Adult Ed Book of Enoch class will be canceled on February 20th, but will resume on February 27th. So make sure you, uh, you remember that. Uh, Passover 2018, quick rem <laughs> She shouldn't be the only one going woo. I mean, come on. <laughs> uh, Passover Seder tickets are on sale today after service. And beginning tomorrow, ticket sales will be open to the public. So please, if you're going to go, get your tickets today. Because uh, the way it's going, we don't know how many we're going to have left, if any. I know. But they're going to go quick. So if you're, if you're going to go to Passover, get your tickets today. Uh, special guest, AMC is pleased to welcome back George and Rivka Witten on Saturday, February 24th for our Shabbat service. Just a quick note. If you've ever got time on your hands and want to do something for the Lord but really don't know what to do, Go down some afternoon around lunchtime to the courthouse. Okay? Plenty of people down there you can witness to. Take my word for it. It just came to me. <laughs> Interesting people. And a lot of them there need God's guidance. So, uh, Air of Perm service. Celebrate Erev Perman with us for a special showing of the movie One Night with the King. Purim refreshments will follow, and that will be on Wednesday evening, February 28th, from 7 to 9 p.m. So please be here for that. And with that, be it slow. Well, we didn't work out a code word or nothing, so. <laughs> <laughs> Please welcome Pastor Anita. Be sure to be nice and slow. Aha. Uh -huh. oh. Special celebration right now. If you had a birthday or anniversary in the month of February, come on up here. I gave birth to somebody in the month of February. Does that count? Do I still get cake? <laughs> well, you could be thinking of Shelly as you sing, okay? That would be good. Birthdays and anniversaries. Birthday? Birthday. I know it's birthday for you, right? Yep. Birthday? 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 Anniversary. anniversary. Birthday. We got one anniversary. Well, let's start with the anniversary first. So, Brigida, it's for you and your husband. Okay. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary to everyone. Happy anniversary to you. Second verse. God's blessings on you. God's blessings on you, God's blessings on everyone, God's blessings on you. Tell your husband.
husband happy anniversary too for us, Brigida. Amen. All right, all the rest of these are birthdays, and so we always like to say to everyone, because we don't know how many people are online watching too, they're being blessed too, so we just say to everyone. In that case, even, even though we, we just had one up here, Brigida, we really mean everyone, and also in case, case that somebody's too shy out there to say anything about it. Right. So, happy birthday now. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to everyone. Happy birthday to you. Second verse. God's blessings on you. God's blessings on you. Pastor Nina, you were up. Oops. Well, since we have a couple of special guests here, I'd like to just let you all know that I'm going with Rabbi Allen when he goes to Israel in March. So I'm very excited about that. I, you know, between you, between you and I, we have a lot of knowledge, husband. And uh, <laughs> both will both be able to be ready and able and willing to, to minister yeah. in this um, very unique opportunity the Lord has given us. You know, it's kind of cool the way God works things out. And um, so I'm just excited. I feel blessed. And now I'm, now I'm kind of in training. Okay, I know it's going to be another time zone. It's going to be this, it's going to be that. So, trying to get ready. Get ready for that. I want to be ready. Speaking of getting ready, today is the day we're going to be speaking to praying. Excuse me, our special prayer is going to be to Israel, the Jewish people, and our congregation. So, I'm just letting those people, I'm um, just giving you a heads up because that's what's going to be coming up. So, now. Let's prepare, and let's stand if we can, and we're going to read together the, from the complete Jewish Bible, Matthew 6, 9 through 13, the Disciples' Prayer. Let us begin. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us the food we need today, and forgive us for what we have done wrong, as we too have forgiven those who have wronged us. And do not lead us into hard testing, but keep us safe from the evil one. For kingship, power, and glory are yours forever. Amen. Okay, I'll be uh, praying for the nation of Israel. Everybody bow their heads. Our Father God, come before you this morning praising you for all of your blessings. We ask for your forgiveness for all of our sins and the many times that we have disappointed you thus last week when we have reacted with our thought. Father God, we thank you for our country and the freedoms that we have to worship you without persecution. With this in mind, we lift up the nation of Israel to you, Father God. Today, Israel continues to be isolated from her neighbors in the world. The evil one continues to use other countries to plot and destabilize the region. And we ask for your protection for this country, Father God. We ask that you thwart the efforts of Syria, Iran, and Russia and their plans to be destroyed. Is Israel going to war? Father God, we're asking for your protection for your people. 
Jerusalem, and the Promised Land. We ask for favor as the local Messianics and other visiting Christians work with the local Orthodox to share Yeshua. We ask that you will soften their hearts, that will, they will come to know Yeshua and his love before it is too late. We thank you for answered prayers in the holy name of Yeshua. Amen. I'm going to be praying for the Jewish people. Father God, we thank you for the privilege of stepping forward in faith and in boldness, Father, to lift up our prayers for our brothers and sisters of the Jewish heritage. Father, we love them and we seek for them to come to know you and to, to serve you and to love you as we do. Father, we just lift up all those in the, the Aretz Israel, in the land of Israel. We lift up those that are uh, spread across the globe, Father. Uh, we look forward to that time when they are all brought together back under your flock, under your care, Father, in the land of Israel. Father, we ask for your blessings upon them wherever they are. We ask that you would place people into their lives that can help to bring them to uh, saving knowledge of Yeshua HaMashiach uh, so that they can look upon him uh, as the one that they is the one true HaMashiach. Uh, Father, we ask these things in the holy name of Yeshua HaMashiach and we just lift up a special prayer for the land, Father of Israel as well. This is your land in your city, in Jerusalem. And Father, we just ask for your special blessing, your special protection. There are those in the world that seek to come against them. And Father, we just ask that, that all the machinations that they would bring, that all the plans and all the efforts and all the, the desires that they would have, that you would make them come to nothing. Father, deplete them uh, of their resources, deplete them of their, their desire to come against Israel. Uh, Father, protect those in the land and protect those wherever they may be in all nations. Uh, for all the earth is yours. In the holy name of Yeshua HaMashiach, amen. I'm praying for the congregation. Dear Heavenly Father, we just ask that you touch every man, woman, and child in this congregation, that you lift up our hearts. Father, direct our steps. Father, fill us with wisdom, understanding, and knowledge, Father, that serves you daily. Father, give us the discernment we need to operate in this world, this world that seems to have turned from you, Father. Just strengthen us so that the world can look on to us and know what your will is. Father, we just thank, thank you for each and every person in here. And continue, Father, to open your word, the Ruach HaKodesh, and all that you have to benefit each and every one of us to strengthen us and guide us. In Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Please remain standing for the Baruchu, Shema, Ve'ahavta, and Ve'ahavta Laracha. So good to see all your faces today. What a blessing to see you. On the screen behind me, please note the Baruchu has a leader's part, an all respond part. Thank you. All right, we are ready. Bless the Lord, the blessed one. Blessed is the Lord, the blessed one, for all eternity. Marhu et Adonai, Hamevorach. Baruch Adonai, Hamevorach, Leolam and the Shema from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Please join with me. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Hallelujah. In the Ve'ahavta from Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verses 5 through 9. 
Love Adonai your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These words which I am commanding you today are to be on your heart. You are to teach them diligently to your children and speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Bind them as a sign on your hand. They are to be as frontlets between your eyes and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And the Ve'ahavta, L'Recha, very small, but so very important. From the Leviticus, verse 19, 18. But love your neighbor as yourself. Please remain standing for this week's scripture readings. The readings this week come from Parsha Terumah, Hebrew for contribution, gift, or offering, and is the 19th Torah portion in the annual Torah reading cycle. The Parsha tells of Adonai's instructions for making the tabernacle and furnishings. Our Torah reading this morning begins with Adonai instructing Moses what to tell the people of Israel regarding taking up a collection an offering for Adonai's tabernacle and furnishings, and to accept contributions, gifts to Adonai, from those who wholeheartedly want to give. Please read with me from Exodus 25, verses 1 through 9. Adonai said to Moshe, Tell the people of Israel to take up a collection for me. Accept a contribution from anyone who wholeheartedly wants to give. The contribution you are to take from them is to consist of gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, fine linen, goat's hair, tanned ram skins, and fine leather acacia wood, oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil, and for the fragrant incense, onyx stones, and other stones to be set for the ritual vest and breastplate. They are to make me a sanctuary so that I may live among them. You are to make it according to everything I show you, the design of the tabernacle and the design of its furnishings. This is how you are to make it. And when you look around our sanctuary, you see a lot of those colors reflected in our setting here. Our Haftarah portion from the Nevi'im, the prophets, is from the book of 1 Kings. Melachim Aleph in Hebrew. Our reading begins 480 years after the children of Israel came out of the land of Egypt in the fourth year of King Solomon's reign over Israel when Solomon began to build Adonai's house. The word of Adonai that came to Solomon, which we will read, is just as applicable to us today as it was then. Let us read together from 1 Kings chapter 6, verses 11 through 13. Then the word of Adonai came to Solomon, saying, As for this house which you are building, if you will walk in my statutes, execute my ordinances, and keep all my mitzvot by walking in them, then I will establish my word with you, which I spoke to your father David. I will dwell among the children of Israel and will not forsake my people Israel. Hallelujah. 
Our Barit Harasha reading is from the book of 2 Corinthians. Our reading teaches us about the rewards of sowing and reaping, that God loves a cheerful giver and will bless you with grace and supply your needs. You see, just as in the Torah portion we read, your attitude regarding giving to Adonai is extremely important to him. Let us also remember that the principle of sowing and reaping applies to all we do, not just financially. Please join me in reading 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 12. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully shall also reap bountifully. Let a one give as he has decided in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace overflow to you, so that by always having enough of everything, you may overflow in every good work. As it is written, he scattered widely, he gave to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now the one who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in everything for all generosity, which through us brings about thanksgiving to God. For this service of giving is not only supplying the needs of the Kedoshim, but is also overflowing with many thanksgivings to God. Hallelujah. Bless you, Lord. Thank you, Lord God, for the opportunity to give, to give back to you, for you give us so very much. And now I invite you to join me for the blessing of Messiah. We will begin with the Hebrew. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu, melech ha'olam, asher natan lanu haderech, Yeshua be Mashiach, Yeshua, Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us the way to salvation in Messiah Yeshua, Amen. And now please welcome Rabbi Allen. All right, uh, all the children come forth to be blessed. All right. All right, Olivia is really being blessed lately. <laughs> Congregation, raise your hands toward her. And all you on the internet, raise your hands toward your own children out there. Father God, we just ask you to bless our young people, Lord God. Bless them immensely, Lord God, that the word of God will be hidden in their heart deeply into the very marrows of their bones, Lord God, and quickly retrieved when that day comes where they need it, either in witnessing or for their own needs, Lord God, that the Word of God would be, would be completely ingrained in their life and their system, that they will always walk in your precepts in all the days of their life, no matter what they face. We thank you in Yeshua's mighty name. Amen. Amen. All right. Hallelujah. We're going to be speaking from Deuteronomy 15 today, so you can certainly turn to that in your scriptures. Before we get started, I, I want to introduce somebody to you. Uh, missionary Song, would you please stand, please? This lady here and her husband, the husband, you could stand with her too. 
is a worldwide known missionary. Every time I get calls from her or whatever, she says, well, I'm in India now, or I'm here, or I'm there. She goes all over the place. She's an awesome lady, so please get a chance to know her by the end of the service. She's the one that invited me to come down and, and speak to the South Korean group. So she's very special in my heart. Thank you very much, Sang. Yeah. Fifteen countries? Oh, okay. It's 15 nations represented in this group. And the South Korean pastor organizes it. Wow. That's even better. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to talking to, to pastors from 15 different countries. This is going to be pretty cool. All right. All right, we're going to talk about Deuteronomy 15 today. Uh, this is one of those chapters where it's a little bit difficult because we are talking about bond servants and slaves and stuff like that uh, in the Bible. It's difficult to try to analyze it all and look it up exactly how it all fits. Uh, but it is interesting. One thing I've come to realize when I've been was studying this is that like the Apostle Paul said, the law is spirit. The law is spirit. So we need to understand how bond servants and slaves work in our life today because there's two different groups. There's the Hebrew bond servant and then there's the stranger slaves that God deals with. And the Hebrew bond servant gets released after seven years and for sure on the year of Jubilee after 50 years. But the Gentile servant or slave is not released. And this is important to understand. However, all the things we're going to read here, God has set rules on how to treat people. And it's unlike any other nation in the world, God set rules on how to treat the bond servants and the slaves. And they are to treat them with, with like members of their own household and family and take care of them. And uh, other nations did not treat their people that way. They didn't treat their people that way at all. And so, but God set rules because he knew these things were going to happen. He knew these things were going to be because most of the uh, non-Hebrew slaves that, Hebrew, that Israel took was a result of war. So it was either kill them all or take some of them as slaves. And so I think with those two options, it was... Uh, it would be better to be a slave in the house of a Hebrew than be killed. But they treated them well, very well. Now, more than likely, down in the course of time, as the people begin to learn, and actually tells you in Scripture that you are to teach your, your, your slaves the Word of God and circumcise them and get them to understand the things of God. So eventually, some of these slaves probably became Hebrews themselves. And when they became Hebrews, then they're subject to the Semita, the seven-year release. So there's all kinds of things that's going on here. Usually when we think of slavery and bond servants, we think of the horrible practices of, of Rome and, 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 and even the early years here in the United States and other places around the world that are still being practiced all over the Middle East and in Africa itself where the Muslims are rounding up people left and right to be slaves all the time. I just read an article two days ago of a whole pile of Africans being sold as slaves by Islam. Islam is a giant slave trader. Even in the early years of the United States, where do you think the United States got their slaves? From Islam. They got them from Islam. Islam would raid villages and haul the entire villages off and then sell them to these groups that in turn bring them to the United States and England and other places and resell them again. Matter of fact, the scripture says anybody who takes a man and makes him a, sla a slave and sells him shall be put to death. So those practices that happened even in the early years of the United States was not of God's will. It was never of God's will because to take people and to sell them 
was a capital punishment sin in God's eyes. And we'll see, we'll be talking a little bit about that at this time. But these kind of things did happen. But there was many reasons for bond servants. Quite often, if you owed a debt and you could not pay it, they would take your house, they would take your land, they might even take your children. And then sometimes the husbands and wives will actually sell themselves to the one they owe the debt to and become a bond servant to that individual, which was really, really was an economic concept. If you had nothing and you were so poor that you were destitute and you could not live anymore and didn't have food and didn't have shelter and you owed somebody, you could sell yourself to those people that you owed money to. And you become a bond servant. And if you're a Hebrew, after, after six years, you were to be released on the seventh year. So even as a bond servant, you were limited how long you had to be a bond servant. It's very important to understand that. Now what is this saying spiritually to us? It's saying spiritually to us that when you are a stranger to the commonwealth of Israel, a stranger to God, it says you do, they do not get released. If you are a stranger to God, you serve that master forever. Now when Paul said the law of spirit, what is he saying here? He is saying that if you are a slave to sin, you remain a slave to sin unless you become part of the household of Israel and that redemption so once you become part of the household of Israel after six years you are to be set free now what's the concept of the Samita that's every seven years the whole idea of seven means completeness and fullness it is talking about our lives our lives so we are to turn ourselves over to God, become part of his household. So we have a samita in our lives, a redemption in our lives, that we are delivered from the slavery of sin. This is the concept. Paul pulls it together quite well in the, in, in the uh, epistles. So we have to, you have to understand these concepts about slave and bond servant in the Bible had a spiritual meaning behind it. If you're a stranger to God, you are, a, you are a slave to sin. And you remain a slave to sin. So sin becomes your master. And that master determines what you will and won't do. We are no longer have a master on us of sin. We've been redeemed by the Messiah. Because we have joined the household of faith. And in seven years, our life is to be completely redeemed. Now, just like the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Unleavened Bread is to be se celebrated for seven days. Why seven days? Because it represents the totality of your life. The first day is the Sabbath, and the last day is the Sabbath of Unleavened Bread. So the first day of, of the Sabbath of Unleavened Bread is the day you received Yeshua as your personal Savior and you became born again. Seven days later, or the totality of your life, is another Sabbath which brings you to the Samita and you are set free in the kingdom of God when you get raptured, basically. So God is using these numbers and these concepts to tell of something that's coming in the future. When you don't have Yeshua, you're a slave, you'll never be redeemed. You'll never be released. But if you got Yeshua, you will be released in the seventh year. Or the year of Jubilee. Whichever comes first. Jubilee is every 50 years. But you will be released and freed we know we have been set free now by Yeshua from the bond of sin. But just like Apostle Paul talked about in chapter 7, he says that I do the things I don't want to do and I don't do the things I should do. So even, and he is talking about in his life, he's still subject to sin in his life and he doesn't like it. But there's coming a time, well everybody that believes in Yeshua 
will be totally set free from the slave of sin. And this is the concepts we need to understand in the scripture when it talks about a bondsman or it talks about a stranger in sin. A stranger in sin is one who is not part of Israel. Once you believe and you have Yeshua, you are part of Israel. Whether you're Jew or Gentile, you're part of Israel. If you're a Gentile, you are grafted in. If you're a Jew, the natural branches got re-grafted in to the house of Israel. So we're waiting for that day that we will be hit our Samita, our seventh year redemption and rest into the kingdom of God through the rapture. So we're waiting on that time. So if you have Yeshua today, you're grafted into the house of Israel, and you're waiting for your Shemitah. You're living now in that seven-year period, symbolically speaking, because seven means completeness. So once you have completed your life on this earth, you will enter into your rest and be set free from everything that besets on us today, whether it be sickness or sin or, or, or persecution or just all right yucky stuff. Uh, look that up in uh, Webster. I think yucky is a word, but <laughs> but this is important to understand. This is what this concept's all about. Like I said, the Apostle Paul used this concepts all the time in in speaking. How this is talking about how we'll be set free by the Messiah. And we know now because God knows beginning from the end, we have been set free. We've been set free. But there's coming a point where we'll actually be set free from this corruptible body. Set free from it. We will no longer have, be subject to sin. Anybody here is subject to sin? Yeah, we better all raise our hands. We're all subject to sin. The Bible says if you say you have no sin, you lie. <laughs> you lie. We're all subject to sin. And so, we're wa and so in that sense, we're sort of still slaves to sin. But we're waiting because we are part of the household of faith. That's why there's a seven-year gap. You're subject to sin still, but you're not totally been set free in the spirit. And we're waiting for that day to arrive where we get set free in the Spirit. Amen? Amen? So let's start with chapter 15 here. Verse 1. At the end of every seven years, you shall make a release. It's called a Shemitah. It is a release of the Lord. Verse 2, and this is the manner of the release. Every creditor that lends uh, unto his neighbor shall release it. He shall not exact it of his neighbor nor of his brother because it is called the Lord's release. Now why is there a debt release? Anybody here would like to see debt releases in their lives? Amen. Yeah, we all would. When our seven years are complete, we're free of debt. When you get raptured and you get resurrected in your incorruptible body, you owe nobody anything anymore. So that's why we're waiting for our Shemitah to come. Very important to understand. And on that seventh year in the physical here, the debts are canceled for the seventh year. Not all, not for the rest of your life, for the seventh year. And the reason is that the debt is released for that seventh year. In the natural, for us it's permanently, but in the natural, it's only released for that year. Why? Because the Lord also commanded that all the fields not be planted in the seventh year. So if you're an agricultural community or you relied on agriculture, whether you run a shop or a field or whatever, if you can't touch your fields in the seventh year, you can't make money. And the Lord's telling the creditors, don't you go and try to collect money from the people in the seventh year because they're not making any money. So the Lord ordered the, all credit to be released or debt to be released in that seventh year. But it resumes after that. When you start planting again, you start growing crops and all that, then you got to still pay your debts. 
Now, some, some um, Bible commentators say that they believe for the Hebrews it's a permanent release, but many others say no. Number three, of a foreigner you may exact it again, but that which is thine and your brother's thine hand shall be released. So based off of verse number three, they saying that, that for a Hebrew, all debts are canceled, but for a foreigner, it's not. That's why some people read into that and say that. However, on the year of Jubilee, regardless the year of Jubilee, all debts are canceled. All debts are canceled on the 50th year. This is a remarkable economic concept. The United States needs to learn from this. Because if every 50 years all debts are canceled, then the banks only loan and have the certain rates up to that 50th year. So there's 10 years until the 50 year jubilee, the banks are only going to give you a 10 year loan. You know? And so, so th payments would be higher. But at the beginning, at the after the 50th year, now you got 50 year terms and all that kind of stuff that could probably be exacted. But on the year, the 50th year of jubilee, all debts are canceled. Because God understood the multiplication of debt. He understood how they can multiply and multiply and destroy a family, destroy a city, and destroy a nation. He understood that. But we don't follow God's precepts in the economic realm. We should, because we wouldn't be in debt today as a country. Two trillion dollars in debt. We wouldn't have that today if we would follow these concepts today. So it's important. God's economic processes, and believe you me, in the millennial reign, those processes will be in effect. God will make sure the nations follow his economic processes in the millennial reign. Four, saying, when there shall be no poor among you, for the Lord shall greatly bless you in the land which the Lord your God has given you for inheritance to possess it. So when there's no poor among you, this is very interesting to understand that if the people of Israel would follow the precepts of the Lord, there will be no poor in the land of Israel. God spells, spells it out quite well in his word. If they do the things that's required of them in God's word, and you obey him, you shall prosper. These are the words of the Lord. You shall prosper, and you shall lend the nations and not borrow. All these concepts, when you obey the commandments of God. When you don't obey the commandments of God, then the opposite begins to happen. So in Israel, when they were, they were poor in the land, something went wrong. Something went wrong when there's poor in the land. There's not supposed to be any poor in the land of Israel. But something went wrong. Either the individual or family, or maybe their collateral damage of somebody else, did something wrong. They weren't obedient to God. When we don't follow God's commandments, we bring curses on ourselves. This is the whole concept of curses and blessings. When we don't follow the commandments of God, we have curses upon ourselves. Now again, it may not be necessarily you, but you could be collateral damage of somebody else doing this stuff. You may say, I didn't do anything wrong, but it could have been others that did things wrong, and now you're, you are part of the collateral damage and you're experiencing the consequences of it. Five, only if you carefully hearken to the voice of the Lord your God to observe to do all these commandments which I command you this day. You know, this is said over and over and over again to follow the commandments of God. And you say, well, what commandments? If you just follow the Ten Commandments, it will work. Follow the Ten Commandments. You don't need to learn 613 laws because a lot of those were, la were laws for only for Israel and the land and for Jerusalem and the priesthood and all that, which Yeshua fulfilled a lot of that when he came. Some of those were nothing but shadow laws Yeshua fulfilled. 
But there's not a one of the Ten Commandments that can be called a shadow law. Every one of them we're expected to follow. Verse 6, For the Lord your God blessed you as he has promised you, and you shall lend unto many nations, and you shall not borrow. You shall reign over many nations, but they shall not reign over you. So when you're following and doing the commandments of God, you have authority. You will not come lacking. Why do people begin to become lacking and poor? Almost always because they did not follow the commandments of God. Almost always. You know, and unfortunately, a lot of women and children face the consequences of it because of their husbands not following the commandments of the Lord. And so they're collateral damage. It may not be their fault, but they're collateral damage because the husband did not follow the commandments of God. They're not blessed anymore. You know, but God will have a tendency of watching after the women and children, regardless of what the husband had said and what the husband had did. Important to understand that we just don't talk about the Ten Commandments. We've got to live the Ten Commandments. Because when we don't, we are slaves. We are slaves to sin. And we want to be redeemed from it. Verse 7, if there be among you a poor man of one of your brethren within any of your gates in the land which the Lord your God had given you, you shall not harden your heart nor shut your hand from your poor brother. So why did the Lord say, th say this? Because the people would say, he's poor because he did something wrong. I'm not going to help him. He did something wrong. Yes, he probably did. But nonetheless, God says, nonetheless, you are to help him. We don't turn our backs on the poor. We don't turn around and say, ah, there must be sin in that person's life. And turn our back on it. That's the compassion God has even for the sinner. And for those under curse. God has compassion for all people. So when you have a poor person in your midst... You don't judge them and say, well, well, they must have did something bad. You help them. Let God sort it out later. We don't sort it out. We see right here in the commandment right here in Deuteronomy. Help them. Don't pass judgment. Don't determine what they did or didn't do. That's God's position. But if they were an Israelite or they're grafted in the house of Israel, Israel and they're suffering, yeah, they probably did something. Or they're collateral damage of somebody who did do something wrong. But our commandment, our commandment isn't to figure that out. Our commandment is to help them. We are to help them. This is compassion God has even for the sinner. Anybody here glad that God has compassion even for the sinner? Oh, yes. Oh, boy. Verse 8, but you shall open your hand wide unto him, and you shall surely lend him sufficient for his need in that which he wants. Open your hand wide. I was in Israel once and uh, with a group of people, and uh, every time the bus would stop, the poor Palestinian kids come running up to the bus. And asking for money, nickel, dime, quarter, that's the only English they knew, but that's what they would say. Nickel, dime, quarter, quarter, dollar, dollar, dollar. And they'd be begging like this. And I'll never forget this man got off the bus and he was surrounded by all these kids. And he decided he was going to give them something. So he reached in his pocket and pulled out a whole handful of change. And he opened his hand up. When he did, one of the kids went, boom! The money went flying everywhere. And the kids scrambled all over the ground. He just sat there watching them grab all his coins. You know, he, was, he had a closed hand. And he was going to pick out a nickel here and a dime here. But when he opened his hand wide, boom, the money went. Right now to all these poor kids. There was a lesson there. There was a big lesson right there in how to treat people. And so, yeah, give unto any man that asks you, as the scripture says. We are to help others. You know, we have to be wise about it. 
be very wise about it. You know, be careful about giving to someone you know is just going to go right around the corner and buy a big bottle of wine. You have to be careful about that kind of stuff. But we, we are required to help people and to give people, give to people. Number nine, beware that there be not a thought in your wicked heart, saying, the seventh year, the year release is at hand, and your eye be evil against your poor brother, that you give him nothing. And he cry unto the Lord against you, and it shall be a sin unto you. So in other words, you know it's the sixth year. One more year, and this poor fellow is going to be released from whatever debt he has. You're not to use that as an excuse not to give. That's what the Lord is saying. He says, well, this is the sixth year, the ninth month. You got three more months to go. Just hang in there. That's not what the Lord says. Help him. Because if he cry unto God, it be held against us as sin. Ooh. So if someone asks you for something, you better be willing to give. Because it can be counted as sin against you. Now what does that mean, counted as sin against you? It does not mean you lost your salvation. But it goes in your book. It goes in your book and it'll be written down. It can affect your possession and rewards in the kingdom of God. There's a lot more to God's plan than just salvation. People need to understand that. When you're in the kingdom of God, it's totally different in the kingdom of God than the plan of salvation. Like I said many times before, the plan of salvation goes through the brazen altar. That's where the blood atonement takes place. And once you pass the brazen altar, you're in the outer court. You have salvation. But we don't want to stop there. We want to go where God is. We want to go where his throne is, the position in the kingdom. And we have to go through the brazen labor to get there. The brazen labor, washing, looking into the brazen labor and seeing ourselves for who we really are and being reminded of who we are. Repentance, being filled with the Holy Spirit, the washing of the word, that all has to do with the brazen labor. Once you do those things, you are now allowed to enter into the inner court where God dwells, where the menorah is, where the table of showbread is, the golden altar is, the Ark of the Covenant, and where God dwells. Not everybody gets to do that. Only those who wash at the brazen labor. The churches need to wake up and quit teaching that all they have to worry about is salvation, salvation, salvation. If they're not saved, yes, that's very, very important because you've got to be saved. But the churches today are preaching to the choir over and over and over again, and they're not telling people there's more than just salvation. There's the kingdom principles. Amen. All in the parables, all over the parables that Yeshua taught, saying the kingdom of God is like. You read and study those parables, they are works, action oriented. You cannot work your way into salvation. That's a free gift of the Lord by faith but once you're saved you're required many things are required of you just like the Hebrews when they came out of Egypt the Hebrews were delivered out of Egypt and Passover by the grace and, and mercy of God not because they deserved it but the grace and mercy of God he brought them out of Egypt and passed them through the Red Sea which is their baptism then they receive the law at Mount Sinai. And God put up with all their complaining and everything else on the way to Mount Sinai. But once he gave them the law, then now they're required to keep it. And when they didn't keep it, judgment fell upon the Hebrew tribes. And sometimes thousands, tens of thousands of them died when judgment fell on them because they didn't keep the law of God. They were redeemed. They were delivered. Now they expect to be obedient. And the church today should understand that today. They're expected to be obedient to God. 
You can't just keep saying, I'm, I'm saved by grace, saved by grace, go sin. I'm saved by grace, I'm saved, I'm saved. You're shaming the name of the Lord. Amen. So what do you mean by that, Rabbi? He says, well, if you tell your neighbor, I'm a believer, I'm a born-again believer, Yeshua is my Lord and Savior, and he's seeing you doing naughty stuff, you're shaming the name of the Lord. Because that neighbor's going, I thought he said he was a Christian. Look what he's doing. Yeah, that's that church stuff. I don't, want anything, I don't want anything to do with that. You're shaming the name of the Lord. Let it not be so. Walk in righteousness. Lift up the name of the Lord. And the only way you can lift up the name of the Lord is being obedient to him. Otherwise, you're shaming him. Today, there are so many believers out there today that say, I'm a believer, I have the Lord as my Savior, I walk in His light, then why do you do works of darkness? If you're walking in His light, why are you doing works of darkness? And what I'm saying is true, because all you have to do is go out there and talk to people on the street. How come you don't go to church? How come you don't believe in God? And listen to what they say. Ah, they're all hypocrites. I don't have anything to do with those people. They say one thing and do another. The world sees believers shaming the name of the Lord. We can't do that. We have to set our hearts and our minds solidly upon the precepts of the Lord and not deviate from it. We're not talking about all the ceremonial laws. We're not talking about the, the uh, uh, shadow laws. We're not talking about any of that stuff. Like I said, you can boil it right down to the Ten Commandments. Just the Ten Commandments. Is it so hard to learn ten laws? It's not hard to learn ten laws. Can you name all the Ten Commandments? Can you name them today? That's how important it is. That we need to know. It used to be that you saw the Ten Commandments everywhere. Written here, written there, being taught to the kids and everything. And what we have when we get rid of the, the Ten Commandments and prayer in school, you get mass shootings in schools. That's what you get. Because they have no heart for God. And they don't think there's any repercussions. They need to be taught. There is repercussions for disobeying God. They need to understand that. And so many people are being taught, well, I'm saved. I'm not worried about it. Well, if you truly are saved, then you're going to be an outer court believer. You'll never get in the inner court face to face with God. And that's where you'll dwell in all eternity. Yes, you might escape the lake of fire. But you will certainly not have position in the kingdom of God. Apostle Paul goes through several times in his epistles saying, those that do these kind of things will not enter the kingdom of God. The inner court is the kingdom of God. You might get your salvation because salvation scriptures are pretty clear. Call upon the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. Trust in the Lord, you shall be saved. Salvation scriptures are pretty clear what you need for salvation. But kingdom scriptures require something of us. God is not mocked. And unfortunately, he's being mocked and shamed all around the world. And we've got to stop that. Verse 11, for the poor shall never cease out of the land. Therefore I command you, saying, you shall open your hand wide unto your brother, to the poor, and to the needy in the land. And if your brother, a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman, be sold to you, and serve you six years, then in the seventh you shall let him go free from you. Same spiritual concept that we're talking about. In the seventh year, if we're slaves to sin, we shall be released. Verse 13, and when you send him out free from you, you shall not let him go away empty. 
You shall furnish him liberally out of your flock, out of your floor, out of your winepress. Of that wherewith the Lord God has blessed you, you shall give to him. And you shall remember that you were a bondsman in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. Therefore I command you this thing this day. So it is with us. When we come into our Shemitah year of redemption, and we come before the Lord, He has gifts and rewards for us. He will not let us appear before Him empty-handed as much as He tells us not to appear before Him with our hands empty. His hands will not be empty either. When we come before Him, He will give us garments of praise, glorious garments, perhaps crowns, although the scripture does say you can lose your crown, let no one take your crown. Rewards can be lost. Salvation probably can't, but rewards can be lost. So you come before the Lord and He, because He redeemed you out of the Master's hand that kept us in sin, the Lord Himself will reward you. Maybe you'd be a pillar in the house of God. All the churches of the Revelation, they all had one common thing. All seven churches. Four were told to repent. And it could be argued that maybe there's a fifth one. But there's something all seven churches were told. That is to overcome. You must overcome. Hello. What does it mean by overcoming? I guess that's what we have to determine in our own life. What sin so easily besets us that we're struggling with? Overcome it. What are we doing in our lives that needs to be overcome? It's probably why the Lord doesn't address what it is you've got to overcome. Now, some commentators say, well, that's all about the last days when the beast comes on the scene and all that. You've got to overcome him. Well, that true. That is true also. But if you die before the beast comes, what is it you have to overcome? The rewards are fantastic. But if you fail to overcome, then you, you don't get to eat from the tree of life. You will not have a throne with the Messiah. You certainly will not have a crown. He'll remove your candlestick out of his house. The seven branch menorah. Seven means completeness. You might as well be looking at a multi-million menorah here of candlesticks. One of them is yours. He removed your candlestick out of his house if you failed to overcome. If you failed to overcome, you will not be a pillar in the house of God. That's the inner court. Inner court concept. All of it deals with the inner court concept. Neither will you have fellowship with him in the table of showbread. We have to overcome. We have to overcome. Anybody here got anything they need to overcome? You're in good company. <laughs> Me too. But I'm working on it. You got to be working on it because God knows the heart. He knows what you're trying to do and what you're trying to overcome. But it can't just be words. You just can't say, I'm going to overcome and never do anything about it. What are you doing about it? If you're actively trying to fix that problem and the rapture occurs, God will understand that you are working on it. But if you use it just as an excuse to keep sinning, you will pay the price. Not unto severe judgment, but unto position and rewards in the kingdom. This is what the church needs to hear all over the place about rewards. Revelation 11 says, Now are all the kingdoms of the world the kingdoms of our Lord. Now he will give out rewards for the prophets, for those that fear his name and to the saints. Revelation 11 is where it happens. Just before the seven vials are poured out upon the earth, that's when rewards are given. Which means by that time, all the raptures are over with. At that time. Anybody still on earth during the seven vials is in serious trouble. But you be gathered together. 
by the multitudes, and the Lord began to hand out your rewards. Wow. What a sight that's going to be. What a time that's going to be. Woo. But there'll be no argument. You're not going to go, oh, that guy got that. Lord, you know, I think I'm worthy of that. <laughs> How come he's shining like a million watt bulb and I'm shining like a hundred watt bulb? This ain't right, Lord. This is not fair. No, we, nobody will say that. Because you will know what you deserve. And you will know without a doubt your position in the kingdom. You will not argue with the Lord because he judges not by the sight of his eyes nor the hearing of his ears. He's the perfect judge. And you will know that. And you will not argue with him. You just be glad to get what you got. And it might be that you're just glad to be there because, you know, you, you're smelling like smoke behind you. <laughs> and you're just glad you didn't go to the other place. Amen. Let that not be so, too. Yeah. If you've been a believer for years, let that never be so. If you come a believer out of a deathbed experience, then maybe so. That might be something you might be thinking about. But if you've been a believer for years and years and years, your, your, your books of good works should be building up. Not dead works, but good works. The holy works that God has called us to do. Dead works get you nowhere. And certainly no works get you anywhere for salvation. But for the kingdom of God, righteous works are important. Not what we devise our own mind, but the things that God said that we are supposed to do. And it's certainly, it's got to be righteous works, not dead works. You're not, if you go outside and, and, and get a whip and start whipping yourself on the back, say, well, I'm suffering for the Lord. <laughs> dead, 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 that's dead works. That is not going to work for you. <laughs> but you give a glass of water to one who is thirsty or help one that is in need, those are righteous works. Those are the things that count. Telling people about Yeshua is a huge one. Because Daniel 12 says, Those that bring many to righteousness shall shine like the luminaries. What's a luminary? The sun and the stars. So you know what's really dear to God's heart is trying to bring people into salvation. That's really big in God's heart. That's really deserving of reward, righteous rewards for that righteous work, bringing people into the kingdom. That's why <coughs> it's important to talk to people. Yesterday, Pastor Nita and I cornered our waiter at a restaurant. He came over there willingly. <coughs> yeah. But when I say cornered, is we kept him there. And he wasn't doing his job, you know, so he didn't want to go. He, he kept looking over these tables he needed to go to, but he wanted to hear what we had to say. The young man was hungry. He said, I never heard of that stuff. I never heard anything like that before. And this poor guy, poor young man, he was probably what, about 20 years old, never heard the things we were telling him. And you could just see this kid eating it up. Nobody has ever told him. So Nita, Nita started it. I was real proud of her about that. She got it going. <coughs> then I joined in. After we kept that kid tied up for 20 minutes, he says, I really got to go to these other tables. <laughs> and he finally took off, you know. But he was so hungry, he wanted to hear what we had to say. There are lots of people like that out there. They want to hear the gospel message. They want to hear what the Word of God says. And I asked the kid, have you ever been to church? He says, yeah, when I was young. <coughs> Why did you stop? He said, I don't know. I saw no interest in it. You know, I just, I said, let me, let me guess. You kept hearing Bible 101 over and over again in so many different ways. 
There was nothing that you figured applied to you. There was nothing that, that perked your interest. He goes, yeah, that's what it was. We are letting our young people down big time by teaching the same thing over and over and over again with a little twist here and there to it. They get bored. They got a lot of things out there today to occupy their minds. Why isn't the church finding ways to occupy their mind through the Word of God? That's what we need. The young people they, with, their, with their computers and their smartphones and their games and everything else, they get bored in church. Why aren't we making it something for them? And I don't mean to, to suddenly do things that aren't of God just to attract people. I'm against that. I don't like the lasers and the smoke and all that in a worship service. I don't like that at all. That's not worshiping God. That's just a show. But I know these young people, if they would hear the word of God solidly, they would be attracted to it, just like this young man came to our table and he stayed there to listen to what we had to say. They're hungry. They're hungry. And we've got to talk to them about the things of God. Seriously talk to them about the things of God. When they keep telling you, oh, I never heard that. I didn't know that. Wow, really? Sometimes I just felt like I wanted to cry. Who dropped the ball on this young man? The church he attended, who dropped the ball? Sad, really sad. <clears throat> Verse 16, if he be that he says, I will not go away from you because he loves you and your house because he is well with you. So a bond servant doesn't want to leave on the Samita, verse 17, you shall take an awl and thrust it through his ear unto the door. And he shall be your servant forever. And also unto the maidservant, you shall do likewise. When I first read that, I, had, I pictured in my mind. <laughs> you can imagine. This poor guy being brought up to a doorpost and they grab his ear and they got this nail they go, hammer him to the door. <laughs> now what? He's hanging there on the door. The more I read about it, what it means is you, when you bring him to the door of the house, that is to be a witness. All the other people come together and meet in front of the door. And you pierce his ear there at the door. And that is an indication that he'll be your servant forever. You know, I can't imagine hammering him to a doorpost. <laughs> what, kind of a, what kind of a covenant is that? You know, hanging there. Is somebody ever going to let me go? No, you're going to be there forever now. <laughs> I even thought that, well, maybe he pulls himself away from the nail, and you go by, you see a little bit of flesh on the nail, and that's indication of it. No, that's not what it is either. It's a witness. When you bring it to the door, just like people bringing you to a gate of a city, there sits the elders, and they are your judges, and they make rulings for you. Same concept. You bring someone to your house, you bring them to the front door, that's where these kind of decisions are made. And so the servant wants to stay with you forever. So you run a hole, you pierce his ear. I'm sure it's a small nail. Well, there's got to be some kind of evidence that he has surrendered himself to you and wants to stay with you forever because he loves you. You know, if you've been taking care of him, feeding him, giving him a wife, he's got children, he's got all these things, he's not going to want to leave because he loves you. That goes a long ways. And so the Lord says, he'll be your servant forever. And any Hebrew bondsman is to be treated like a family member. A family member. You got to understand, they're not hard workers toiling out there. They're family members and be treated as family members. A foreign slave that's brought into the house, it tells us 
in Leviticus 24 that if you hurt that slave, you cause him to lose an eye, you let him go free. You hurt him seriously, you are to let him go. This is how God knew that these things are going to be, but he gave rules and how you are to treat people. Slave or free, you had a certain way you treated people. And if you hurt that slave, he is to be released. I wish we, we in the United States in early years understood that. Because people argued all kinds of ways to keep slavery going. But they really searched it out to realize that you cannot treat people like we did in the early years of this country. You cannot do that. It's against the scripture. Number one, if that person was kidnapped and sold, death penalty to the people who did it. But if it was done legitimately, you are to treat them well and not hurt them. Wow. Verse 18, it shall not seem hard unto you when you send him away from you, for he has been worth a double hired servant to you, and serving you six years, the Lord your God shall bless you in all that you do. 19, all the firstling males that come out of the herd and out of the flock shall sanctify, you shall sanctify unto the Lord your God, and you shall do no work with the firstling of your bullock, nor shear the firstling of your sheep. The firstling is always the Lord's of your animals and actually also of your humans. They're the Lord's. So you, don't, you do not put a calf to work, nor do you share the sheep. It is the Lord's, which means it will be offered as a sacrifice, not people, but the animals. Verse 20, and you shall eat it before the Lord your God year by year in the place which the Lord shall choose, you and your household. So if you have a firstborn of an animal, it is to be sacrificed to the Lord, and then you are to take portion of that. The priest gets a part, the Levites get a part, and you get a part, and there you are supposed to eat it before the Lord. What a moment that must be. There must be a lot of picnic tables around the temple these things taking place like that. 21, if there be any blemish therein, or if it be lame or blind or have any ill blemish, you shall not sacrifice it unto the Lord your God. And you shall eat it within your gates. The unclean and clean person shall eat it alike as a roebuck in the heart. Only you shall not eat the blood thereof. You shall pour it upon the ground as water. We've talked about this a lot about you. We are, cannot eat blood. For it is the life of the flesh. And God has given blood for our atonement, not for us to eat. Very important scripture. It was given to Noah. And certainly at the Jerusalem council, when talking about what to do with the Gentiles, it was one of the laws mentioned. Tell them not to eat any blood. It's an important commandment. But we don't want to get overly legalistic about it. What I mean by that is that it's talking about eating blood. So you, you, you're going to barbecue a steak. You put it on the grill. You start cooking it. Blood and fat drips out of it. You say, well, I like mine medium. So you cook it medium. You pull it on a plate. You serve it. And there's some red fat on the plate because you cooked the medium. That's not time to panic. It's not, it's not a, a violation of the law of God. He's talking about taking blood, whole blood, and eating it and drinking it. That's what he's talking about. The Orthodox, they will cook that meat into leather. <laughs> and make sure there is no blood in it. But I guarantee if they take a little chunk of that meat and put it under a microscope, you're going to see molecules of blood in it. Where do you draw the line? I shouldn't have said that. Now they're all going to get microscopes and double check, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we have to understand it's talking about eating blood. When it says you're going to pour it out in front of the altar, it's got to be loose blood, 
Blood you fill up in a cup or a basin, that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about that you see a little pink in your meat. We're not talking about you see a little pink in, 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 on the plate after you barbecued your steak. It's, that's not what we're talking about. That gets to the point of ridiculous after a while. But the blood itself is the life of the flesh, and it belongs to the Lord, for he has given it as atonement for us. Amen? Amen. All right, let's, let's pray over our offerings. <coughs> let's lift up our offerings. Just like when people came and brought their their grain and their barley and their wheat and their heave offerings of animals, whatever, they would lift them up to the Lord. That's why we do this. To be presented to the Lord God himself. Father God, we just ask you to take these offerings. We ask you, Lord God, to multiply them back to the givers, Lord God, that they may prosper and never be lacking anything. They may not get that Cadillac, Lord God, but it's okay if they got a nice running car. We don't ask for things in vain like that. If you can afford it, great. If you cannot, you don't put yourself in debt by doing stuff like that. Lord, I just thank you for your offerings, Lord God. They are unto you and they are holy. Every one of these people holding up their offering, it is holy unto you. And Lord, we thank you for these offerings. In Yeshua's mighty name, amen and amen. Oh. 
shall sing the praises of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From this time forth and forevermore, my lips shall sing your praise. My lips shall sing the praises of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From this time forth and forevermore, my lips shall sing.
We have been delivered. <clears throat> and our master is Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ. And I say unto our master, take my ear and nail it to your door. I am yours, Lord. I am yours. Drive a stake through my ear because you drove stakes through your body for me. Drive your stake through my ear that I may serve you all the days of my life. I am yours. I make a covenant with you because you made a covenant with me. I love you because you first loved me. There isn't anything I can say and do that you didn't do first for me. I just want to grab a hold of those things, Lord, and I offer them up to you. Pierce my ear, Lord God, for you, that I may have an ear that always listens to you, listens and obey the Shema, that I will Shema with you all the days of my life. You're not asking me to pierce anything else like you did for me. Your feet, your hands, your side, they were pierced for us. Pierce my ear, Lord God. Pierce my ear that I will always be in tune with you, always listening to your word, what you would have me do. Shema, hear and obey. That's what I desire, Lord. And I know there are people here today that want to surrender to you, Lord God. They want their ear spiritually pierced also to your door, Lord. To be with you forever in the house of our God. Lord, reach down and meet their needs right now. Let's all close our eyes and raise our hands. Father God, among everybody that's in this house today, Lord, I just ask you to come down and meet their needs, Lord. That they may have a closer relationship to you. That they will surrender their ear to you, Lord God that they will surrender their heart and their mind to you, Lord God, in all that you ask and all that you request of us, Lord. We want to be a pillar in the house of our God. We want to have a throne next to you, Lord. We want a crown that you deem us worthy to have, Lord God. It may be full of jewels. We want to eat from the hidden manna. We want the stone with a name written on it that nobody knows but you. And you will put your name on us, Lord God, and the name of the Son and the name of the city upon us, the new Jerusalem. Lord, that we may have the honor to rule and reign with you on this earth when you come back. That we will have a mansion prepared of you in the new Jerusalem that we may dwell in. <clears throat> that we will have our own spiritual mailbox <clears throat> that would say, here is a servant of the Most High God. Those are the words we want to hear, Lord God. That we are your servant. We bow before you, Lord. We humble ourselves before you. We are not worthy. None of us are worthy 
of the things that you have for us. For eyes have not seen nor ears have heard of the things that God has for those who love him. And no matter what it is, Lord, we will look upon those gifts and rewards for us knowing full well that we were not worthy. But because of your love for us, you will provide them. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. And as we go this day, Lord, be mindful of your people. For you told us in Psalms that we were made little lower than Elohim. That is why we will also judge angels. We've been made a little lower than Elohim because we were made in the image of God. What a great honor. What a great honor, Lord. And let us meditate and contemplate on the concepts of what you have for us, Lord God. Even though we know we are not worthy, and even though there's a day coming, we will answer for everything we said and did. Not unto judgment, but unto rewards. But we're all in the same boat, Lord. We shall not be ashamed because of Yeshua. Lord, let us set our eyes upon you. Open up our eyes, our spiritual eyes, Lord, that we may see you. Do away with our blindness. Do away with our cataracts that we see everything fuzzy in the spirit, Lord God, that we can see you more clearly and honor you and worship you, Lord. Perform that spiritual surgery on our eyes and our heart, Lord God. that we may be a renewed creature in you, Lord God, and serve you all the days of our lives with joy, with honor, and with love. We thank you in Yeshua's mighty name. Amen. Amen.
the Lord commanded Aaron and his sons that any time they were gathered before the house of Israel, they were to bless them with this blessing. It is no different with us today. The Lord desires to bless us. you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance toward you and give you peace. The peace of the Sar Shalom, the Prince of Peace. And the only way he can lift his face toward you if you are sinless. And the only way you can be sinless is through Yeshua. God will see you as sinless even though we know we're not. But Yeshua has made you sinless. The Prince of Peace, let peace rule in all your members. In the things you see, the things you hear, the things you speak, the work of your hands, where you go with your feet, let peace surround you, for you are the light of the world. And the world is full of darkness, and you need to be a light to show the people of darkness there is an answer. And that answer is Yeshua. Go in peace now. Let the peace that passes all understanding fill your mortal bodies and your heart and your spirit. In Yeshua's mighty name. Amen. If anybody needs prayer, there will be elders up here.